um, invite uh, Dr. Darnell to give his presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, Seth. And uh, I, I have to say, it's inspiring for me to be here. Because one of the things you learn in the laboratory is the best ideas, the best sparks of creativity oftentimes come from the youngest people. And you guys may not realize it, but uh, your open minds and your ability to think creatively about the world that would not in a concrete or predestined way is very important to the lifeblood of creativity in the laboratory. That's one of the things I try to teach my students is uh, when you come into the laboratory, if you're doing good science, uh, we're all on the same playing field. Right away in science, you become a peer. It's the the teacher-student relationship disappears because we're working on the edge of the unknown. And that's true in basic science, and that's true in clinical science as well. So I want to try and uh, drop a few pearls of wisdom for you. Uh, one of them is the way we think about science in terms of uh, you know, both the detail of what you have to learn and understand at the bench and the laboratory to do a single experiment, and at the same time, how to keep uh, a bigger focus on science, so the, the big picture. And uh, you know, one way of thinking of this is, you know, I, I like this little picture here, the man standing on top looking in the microscope, and all these different observations down there waving for your attention. So there are many different aspects of what you can see in science. It's really infinite, right, with different kinds of things you can look for. And um, you need both at the same time the attention to detail what's going on, and you need to maintain an ability to continue to see the big picture for light at the end of the tunnel, however you wish to think of it. So um, for our laboratory, I, I've ended up working a, with a group of people working in a very esoteric group of diseases, and esoteric is a word I should define, SAT, maybe any SATs for you. Esoteric means known to the chosen few. Okay, it's a word that means something that's very uh, obscure from general knowledge. And yet, at the same time, sometimes looking under the microscope, almost by definition, you're seeing something esoteric. If you're looking for something that people haven't seen before, it's known to you, and you and your mentor. So the question is how you extract from something so esoteric something that's important at the end of the day. So it's, it's for, for my laboratory, we work on things that many people would consider esoteric. It's unknown, obscure science. Uh, but what we're trying to do is keep the big picture of something important that we want to reach at the end of the day. Because there are many false sort of positives. You, know, you can study a molecule that may not be so meaningful, or you can study a molecule that may cure a big disease. So keeping this in the back of your mind is important. I'm trying to drop that as a pearl for you right up front. Keep your ideals about what it is you're after, what it is you want to discover, uh, even while you're looking uh, at the fine minutiae of science. So I'm going to give you some examples of this sort of uh, dynamic tension between looking at the obscure detail and keeping the big picture in, in mind. And what I'm going to talk about is what uh, Dr. Bhattacharya was saying, that is translational research. Okay, translational research is where uh, you take observations, there may be detailed observations at the bedside, bring them into the laboratory, try and understand what was going on at the bedside to develop a new treatment, a new diagnosis, a new cure for a disease, and bring it back. So it's bedside to bench, and then bench back to bedside research. So the first example I'm going to give you uh, is going back uh, 90 years or so. So this is a children's ward, a pediatric hospital in 1920. Uh, and a major killer, uh, and by major, I mean one out of six children, maybe one out of five children, um, died before they reached one year of age in this country, the U.S. Um, and the major cause of death at that time was bacterial pneumonia. I don't know if any of you have ever had pneumonia. Nowadays, if you get pneumonia, you take a pill, Zithromycin or something like that, and it goes away. In these days, one out of five kids die from it. So it was a major cause of uh, problems. And scientists, clinical scientists, translational scientists, were interested in trying to figure out what was going on in these kids. Okay. Um, so the breakthrough, the first breakthrough, uh, came from this guy, Alexander Ben Fleming. Okay. And 
Um, what he did, which was uh, very esoteric, was he was growing the bacteria from the lungs of these kids, pneumonia and other dwellings, growing them on a petri dish like this. And one day he made, you probably know this story, but the most esoteric, obscure observation that really nobody in the world would be interested in, which was that a piece of fungus, a piece of mold, landed on this petri dish by accident because he set it near the window at night. And so most scientists would have taken that petri dish and thrown it in the trash can because it was contaminated with a little piece of mold. And he looked at it here and, okay, bingo, this is one of the most important discoveries in all of this, okay, from, from seeing that this little piece of mold here uh, didn't have bacteria growing around it. Well, I don't know if you can see these white dots here. Those are the bacterial colonies that he was studying for the kids with pneumonia. And this piece of mold here didn't have so much bacteria around it. It was all at the edges of the dish. So that's a really obscure observation. Nobody in the world could ever make. So if it was esoteric, known to the chosen few, it was known only to him. Okay. And he pursued it and discovered that this mold was made from a substance which we call penicillin. Okay, and that would, led to the discovery that saved millions of lives, including my parents' lives, and maybe your parents, your great parents' lives, and probably your lives, because one out of five of you might not be here if this hasn't been discovered. Okay, so this observation was not uh, left all by itself in the 1930s, 40s. We were still interested in what was going on with these bacteria. And I'll show you another observation now. It was made by three scientists, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, right here at the Rockefeller University. So if you go out at the end of the lecture, you know, there's a driveway in the middle here. If you go to the top of that driveway, there's an old brick building. That was the original building at Alfred Rockefeller University where medical research was started. And then to the right of it, there's another old brick building, and that's the Rockefeller Hospital. So that hospital now has 35 beds in it. It's free, no patients are charged for it. It's funded by the NIH, National Institute of Health. So the federal government pays for all the patient care. And the only criteria for getting in there is you, uh, you have to have a disease that one of the doctors is trying to figure out what's wrong. Okay, it's translational research. So I'm a translational researcher. And it's really a tradition set up by these guys and these guys. So these guys were at the Rockefeller Hospital in the brick building right up here. Um, and, um, Matt McCarty uh, is this guy, just uh, passed away unfortunately a few years ago. So this is up to modern times. And what these guys did was go back to this plate of um, that Ben Fleming had discovered and notice that there were two different kinds of bacteria. They don't show up real well here, but I think by word were blown up, some of the bacteria were small and had rough edges, but some of the bacteria were bigger and had smooth edges. Okay, so this is a famous story in science here. And they wondered, what is the difference between those two? And they did various things, tricks to try and understand what was the difference between the two. And really, this guy and all three together figured out that if you make an extract from these rough cells and put them on top of other cells, you can turn them into these bigger smooth cells. And the extract the material, they purified down to one molecule. You know what it was? Hmm. This is their actual data, and they scored how many cells became rough or smooth. This is an actual notebook from these guys. It's an important notebook like yours might be, so keep your good notes. The material is DNA, okay? So what they found was the DNA could change the nature of a bacteria from one type to another type. And that was the fundamental observation of the 20th century in terms of science. This is the fundamental observation in terms of clinical medicine to secure it for many lives, and it's hand in hand with basic science. So the two often go right together, right? There's almost a, a blurred distinction between the two. DNA, as you know, is the uh, genetic material that distinguishes not only a small from a big bacteria, but distinguishes.